Good to see everybody here this morning, and pray the Lord will bless us with his presence as we meet together. Let's take our course books and turn to page number eight. Page number eight. We'll sing this together to begin our time of worship. Complete in thee no work of mine. Complete in thee no work of mine. May take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, no more shall sin. Thy grace hath conquered, reign within. Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, each want supplied, and no good thing to me denied, since thou my portion, Lord, wilt be. I ask no more, complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen may I be, at thy right hand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. What a comforting hymn. Bob's coming to read for us. Good morning. Please turn with me to Psalm 106. Praise ye the Lord. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O oh, visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory within thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquities. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remember not the multitude of thy mercies but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. 
And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. They envied Moses all in the, also in the camp, and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered up the company of Abiram. A fire was kindled in their company, and the flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into a similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which did great, had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land, and they believed not his word, but murmured in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves unto Balapior, and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague brake unto them. Then stood up Phineas and executed just judgment, so the plague was stayed. That, and that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. Because they provoked his spirit, so he spake unadvisedly with his lips. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them unto the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times did he deliver them, and but they provoked him with their counsel and brought low in their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied among all those that carried them captives. Save us, our Lord, our God, gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in their praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting and let all the people say amen. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. May we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we can read your word. May you open our eyes to see and ears to hear it, dear Lord. As it speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Be with Ken as he brings forth the message this morning, proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take our bulletins, and on the inside cover, we'll sing this hymn to the tune of, This is my Father's World. Lord, now thy people meet, 
to praise and worship Thee. We bow ourselves before Thy feet and homage raise to Thee. For Thou art God alone, eternal Lord of all, with contrite hearts before Thy throne. Upon thy name we call, though far from thee we stray, show mercy is our cry, without thy sovereign grace and aid, we must forever die. Oh, grant that we would live to praise and honor Thee. All laud and glory we will give now and endlessly. Exalt Thy Son, O Lord, who hung upon the tree. For by His death we were restored and justified by Thee. Christ is our righteousness, His death upon the cross has saved us from our sinfulness, from endless pain and loss. No better news than that, is it? Justified by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Robert's going to come and read for us. Good morning. Ephesians chapter 4, the reading of the Lord's Word. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led ca captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he has ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of one of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual workings in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all in cleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have learned him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which is Christ, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, and that may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearty, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Let us pray. Father, we come before you now and we thank you for the word. Lord, you're worthy to be praised. Lord, as Paul says, I pray that we're all prisoners of Jesus Christ and that we can put on the new man, which is Christ. Lord, we ask that the Spirit guide us and teach us about, uh, teach us Christ. Lord, let us be tenderhearted and forgiving of one another. Let us look to Christ today, forgive us of our sins, and be with Brother Kenny as he delivers the word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 296. We'll stand and sing this together all the way. My Savior leads me. Definitely this is our testimony of grace from beginning to end. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. David's coming to read for us. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 19. What shall we say then? Is the law of sin? God forbid. Now I had, known, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. 
Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was in that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that in it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. That in it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Father, well, without the blood and sacrifice of Christ, we would all die in our sins. Our sinful nature is the cause of death, not the law. The law is holy from a holy God. As Ken preaches your word, give us eyes to see the truth in Christ. Amen. I've entitled this message, The Struggle Within. Any of us that are the Lord's, I believe, can identify with what Paul has written here because we wonder about this struggle that is within us. If we know that the Lord Jesus Christ has paid our sin debt and put it away at the cross, then when the Spirit has been pleased to reveal Him in us, why do we still have such a struggle with sin? We just have been studying how Paul said that by Christ's death, we're dead to sin. And we've seen that that doesn't mean dead from its presence. As long as we're in this flesh, there's going to be a battle. I say the fact that you feel the struggle is a good sign. That's a sign of life. Dead folk don't feel anything. They're dead. And there are a lot of religious folk that when you talk about a struggle with sin, they look at you kind of like a deer in a headlight, and say, well, didn't you tell me that you made a decision for Jesus, and aren't you living the victorious life, and all these things they throw at you? And we have to humbly bow and say, whatever they call the victorious life, if they don't have any sense of their sinfulness, not just one sin or the other, but <laughs> sinfulness, the only thing that you can conclude is they must still be dead, else they wouldn't be reasoning the way they do. No, sin is very real in us. In fact, this nature is such that the only thing that is going to kill it is when we die. Other than that, this flesh is what it is. We've inherited it from our father, Adam. And it's just like with us, our characteristics that we've gotten from our parents or father, you can't change what you are. Your personality is what it is. People try to change, but you're still... If you're choleric, you're going to be choleric. If you're sanguine, you're going to be sanguine. If you're melancholic, you're going to be melancholic. If you're phlegmatic, you're going to be phlegmatic. Some people are always, why is he always down in the dumps? Well, that's the way the Lord made him. And we're not going to break free from that nature. When the scriptures say that we're dead to sin, we're dead to its curse. And that's where I find some comfort, is that Regardless of what this sin is, and it is daily, not just in word and deed, but thought, and yet it cannot condemn me. Amazing that when the Lord Jesus Christ paid the sin debt, he paid the sin debt. It was paid once for all and forever, justified. And you say, well, then why is the sense of sin so present with me? Well, don't you suppose the Lord purposed that too, lest you should put any confidence in your flesh? In his high priestly prayer, he prayed to the Father that the Father would not take his disciples out of this world, but to keep them in this world from evil. And that's why we pray what the Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth even as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and deliver us not 
to evil. Deliver us not to temptation. All the Lord has to do is take his hand off you one second and you'd be right off that cliff. But there's the glory of his work is that there is no sin for which any for whom the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the debt will ever be condemned. And so Paul here, after so boldly, you see that in Romans 7 and, and verse 6, the, the last verse we considered together, that if now we are delivered from the law, see the law can no longer condemn. The law of God's holy, it's just. It reveals God's holiness and justice. But that law, where at one time it was our enemy, because that's all the law can do is condemn, yet now we've been delivered. How? Through a just payment, a just satisfaction. It's like somebody that committed a horrendous crime, and after a while you see him back out on the street, and you wonder, well, what kind of injustice is that? Well, if the law has been satisfied and it's done in a just way, then that person walks free. There's no condemnation because the law has been satisfied. That's how we walk, freely. Not that we don't deserve condemnation, but we cannot be condemned because Christ has paid the debt. That all comes back to his work on the cross. And when it says there in verse 6 that being dead, that is when Christ died, we died. That's the just payment. Wherein we, are, we were held at one point under the law that we should serve in newness of spirit. And there I'd put a capital S. The spirit of Christ revealed in the heart causes us now to live in the newness of that spirit. Not in fear and bondage of thinking, oh, you know, if I sin again, maybe I'll be condemned. No, there is therefore now no condemnation. And he says, and not in the oldness of the letter. Have you ever gone back and read recently the old letter of the law? If a person so much as picked up sticks on the Sabbath day, they were to be stoned to death. If a child rebelled against the parents and the parents said, okay, enough's enough. I'm taking you to the elders. And the elders heard the story. The parent was to be the one to throw the first stone. I know sometimes as parents, we probably felt like my, that might be a good solution. But that was the oldness of the letter. See, that's of the law. But it's not that way with us. We know ourselves to be condemnable. And we know ourselves to be worthy of nothing but the wrath of God. But oh, the freeness to be able to serve the Lord in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Why? The law has been satisfied. But there's a struggle, and that's what Paul, by the Spirit of God, is describing here. Someone once said, you know, if Paul ever sat down to fill out a resume and uh, that they asked him about his lifestyle, can you imagine if he answered as he does here? Well, in verse 15... That which I do, I allow not, but for but what I would, that do I not, and what I hate, that do I. Can you imagine sitting in front of an employer <laughs> telling them the truth? Like some of those questions on those interviews, they ask you, have you ever been tempted to steal? We had a young man here that was going for his first job interview a number of years ago. And he came across that question, and he told him yes. And he got denied. Because they thought, well, if we hire him, we're hiring a, a, a thief. Well, what did you want him to say? A lot of people fill that out and lie just to get the job. But the truth is, left to ourselves, that's what we are. The things we would do, we do not. And the things we would not do, those we do. And that's, Paul is not speaking here of his state before conversion. There's some self-righteous people that when they try to explain Paul here, they think, oh, that was before he was converted. Well, no, as you read on there, you'll see in verse 22, he says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In other words, he's declaring the problem isn't with the law. It's with me. 
I truly believe that any that are taught of the children of God, you're not going to blame God for your sin. You're not going to blame the law. Well, if he just hadn't given the law, then there wouldn't be a problem. No, he recognizes that the law is perfect. But that's our problem. It's perfect. And if we have to answer to it in any way, then it can only condemn. So let's look at this together, beginning in the first part of verse 7. That's the question that Paul's asking here when he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Are we to blame the law? You know, if we follow his train of thought to this point, we can understand how someone might infer this. Just like at the beginning of chapter 6, you preach the grace of God strong enough, someone's going to infer that you're saying, well, let's continue in sin that grace may abound. You can't preach the grace of God strong enough for people to where ultimately they don't ask that question. Oh, so what you're saying then is I can sin. Just like now when I tell you that there's no sin for which God will ever condemn one for whom Christ paid the debt. That justification at the cross, that's our, our foundation, our freedom. But are we then going to say, well, then I'm free, so I'm just going to go out and live my life the way I want to? Same here with regard to the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? That would be the conclusion of some that might think that. And that's why some accuse us of what we call, they call antinomian. Everybody ever heard that term? Anti means against, nomos, nomian means the law. And so when we say that we've been delivered from the law, oh, happy condition, they go, ah, antinomian. Why? Because they're thinking that somehow that law still has something for which we need to be subject in order to please God. And as we're going to see here, the law has never made anybody righteous. Not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. But at the same time, the problem isn't with the law. We're not saying that if we've been delivered from the law that somehow the law was evil. Here's where in the second part of verse 7, Paul declares boldly, no, the law is good because it reveals not only sin in us, but it's good because it reminds us again and again of the holiness of God. And that apart from that work of the Lord Jesus Christ, having taken the sin of his people on himself, that law would condemn us. That's why Paul says here in verse 7, Nay, for God forbid to think that there's a problem with the law. Nay, he said, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So the law, it's like that x-ray machine when you go to the doctor and it reveals something wrong inside of you, are you going to stand up and jump up and down and say, well, that's stupid x-ray machine. There's a problem with the x-ray machine. No, all the x-ray machine does is reveal what's inside. And you can't blame an x-ray for what it exposes. And that's really what Paul is saying here. He said, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet when you go back and read the law just a lot of people say well the ten commandments at least that i'm following <laughs> how's that working for you because when you read what the ten commandments have to say they're like that x-ray machine they expose the sin in you and in every one of those when you read it if you come away feeling better about yourself, well, I've done like this one here, check that box, this one here, you haven't read it aright. Because the law exposes what is within us. And 
we would honestly never know what it is to be before a holy God were it not for the law. That's why the law is good. First, it reveals the holiness of God. How holy must God be that nothing less than perfection will answer to his holiness? That's why the law was given, that it might reveal his holiness, but secondly, that our mouths might be stopped, that every mouth might be stopped. Remember, we saw that already in chapter 3. And the whole world found guilty before him. But it was also given to point us to Christ. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to earn and establish that righteousness necessary that God might be just to declare what? Righteous. Everyone for whom Christ paid the debt. So we'd never know that we were sinful or sinning. Something as simple as covetousness. You see that here? When Paul says, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But then he explains in verse 8, but sin had taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Until God was pleased to take that law and reveal it in his heart, he was dead to whatever sin was in there. He wasn't even thinking about it. Most people, when they think about a sin, they think about murder, adultery, some other type of sin that's, that's aggravated. But covetousness? When was the last time you had a covetous thought? Well, it was the last time you complained about something. <laughs> That's all it was. Maybe you didn't even express it. But it came through your heart. And that's what covetousness is. It's desiring something that the Lord hadn't given you, or it's finding fault with what he has. By that alone, in fact, Paul in Colossians calls it idolatry. The sin of covetousness, which is idolatry. That's why idolatry begins with the word I. I'm not happy. Really? What does that matter? It's how the Lord has ordained your steps. And so we're all covetous. Now here, when Paul is expressing this, I think of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, if you'd like to turn over there. So this is the struggle within. And it's a real struggle. Because of our flesh, the problem isn't with the law. But here in Matthew chapter 19, there is a rich young ruler that came to Christ in verse 16, called him good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And in verse 17, when the Lord said to him, why callest thou me good? He's not denying that he was the good master. But he's challenging this rich young ruler as to why he's even calling Christ good because he denied he was God. And he said, there's none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. That is a path. That if you would enter into life and the law commands perfection, then on that path, follow perfection. But if you can't do it perfectly, then that's that road closed. That's not a way. And so you can see this rich young ruler, just like Paul describes here, where he was dead to sin. He thought himself to be blameless before the law. That's how this rich young ruler was reasoning. He saith unto Jesus, verse 18, which, which commandment? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And here's how this rich young ruler was showing that he was dead to the law, had not seen it aright, because the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? What else you got? Imagine saying this to the Lord Jesus Christ. Such blindness. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, because that's what that road demands, perfection, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt 
have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. That's an interesting word. It actually means repentant. But that word of the Lord was like an arrow to his heart. A lot of people read that and say, well, he went away in rebellion. He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. This is one of the reasons why I believe this may well have been Saul of Tarsus. By his own testimony. Because he said he saw himself as perfect before the law until the commandment came. What commandment was it? Thou shalt not covet. That was where the Spirit of the Lord brought that arrow home to his heart. And suddenly now he saw himself to be nothing but a covetous sinner. And that's why Christ said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? He's trusting in his riches. And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I've heard some even try to explain that away. Well, you know, every city had a little opening at the end if the door was closed and a camel that little place where they could go down and get through with their camel was, was like going through an eye of a needle. That's not what Christ said. When he said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he's talking about an actual needle. And you respond, well, that's impossible. Well, exactly. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? And that's the Right response with regard to the law. Who can be saved? If that law is not satisfied, answered on my behalf, who can be saved? It's not just what I do and say, but, but my very thoughts are condemned by the law. And so coming back here to my text in Romans 7, continuing this thought, Paul shows us then that it's sin that corrupts the commandment. It's not the law that makes us corrupt. It just reveals what's in us. He says in verse 8, Sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. The law is just the x-ray. That's the light. Let's bring some, doctor says, let's get some light on this thing. You can't blame the doctor. You can't blame the light. The problem's what's in here. And he said, for without the law, sin was dead. Without the Spirit of God taking that law and revealing what is inside, sin was dead. In other words, I wasn't even mindful of it. And that, the reality of that is, and it takes the Spirit of God because I dare say if we were raised in a congregation where the Bible was read and we learned Bible verses from our youth up and all this, how... We recited those verses just for the challenge. I remember Bible drills. Get your Bible up and hold it by the back. And on your mark it said go. And we'd look up the verse to be the first. And we'd read it. It didn't matter what it was saying. We just, we, I wanted the ribbon. I wanted to win the Bible drill. Be the fastest on the draw. But that's not why the scripture is given. That's not why the law was given. Here without the law sin was dead. He's saying, without the law actually being brought home to my heart, it, it was as if I had no sin. And so we see here sin, it says, taking occasion there in verse 8 by the commandment. It's saying that sin took opportunity by the commandment. The weakness of the law isn't the law. The weakness of the law is in us. That's got to be plain. Our hearts are so wicked that they even find opportunity for all manner of evil desire from something good like the law of God. And there are a lot of people that excuse their sinfulness because of that. They say, well, we can't keep it anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and sin and live my life however I want to. This word here, when it says in verse 8, but sin taking occasion. That's the word opportunity. And in the Greek, it's actually a military term referring to a base of operation. 
that sin taking occasion of the law set up a separate base of operation rather than being subject to the law. Went over here and said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and live my life however I want to. And so he makes it plain that the law is good. Apart from the law, sin was dead. But what it's really showing us is just how evil we are. The fact that we could even at any point think somehow the law is to be blamed or God to be blamed for our condemnation. How great must be the evil that is within us. It took, when it says taking occasion, it's like, a, again, a military term, a rebel group of soldiers deciding they don't want to be under the commandment of their superior. They're going to come over here and establish their own base. That's what sin has done. That, that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. When God said you can have eat of every tree of the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had the tree of life. But what they do? They went over and set up a separate base. Removed themselves from under. Thought they would. And yet it only brought condemnation. And that's true of anything. If, if it can take something good and holy like the law... And that's my answer to those that accuse us of being antinomian. No, law is good. That's our first answer. God, law is holy. Problems in here. That's why I don't preach up the law. It's any kind of means of either gaining salvation or maintaining it for justification or sanctification. It cannot help. It can only point out what's wrong. But that's what sin will do. It warps anything that is good. It'll take love and turn it into lust. It'll take a, a sincere desire and turn it into greed. That's what is in our nature. Now Paul, in verse 9 then, he speaks here as if he was in a state of ignorance, which he was. Before the law was revealed in him. We're talking about a, a man that grew up and cut his teeth on the law. He was considered to be a, a lawyer of lawyers. With regard to being able to teach the law. And yet he has to confess here. There was a time when he didn't know it. He didn't acknowledge what that law was. Verse 9. I was alive. Without the law once. But when the commandment came. He said sin revived. And I died. When he says I was alive. He wasn't alive spiritually. But he wasn't even aware. It's like driving down the road. You've lost. Uh, not paying attention. And all of a sudden that speed limit sign. You know changes from 70. Down to 55. And you, you, you got those signs warning you ahead. Speed zone ahead. 45. And you just keep busting on down there. You're alive. You're not thinking about it until all of a sudden you hear the siren look in your rear view mirror and all of a sudden there's the cop. And he comes up and asks for your registration and license and asks you why you think he pulled you over. <laughs> you know, you might play dumb for a while, but after a while he's going to tell you your radar had you going 75 in a 45 mile an hour zone. There's an example of you were alive for a while, music playing, and weren't thinking about it, and all of a sudden, here comes the law. And it says there's sin revived, and I died. That sinking feeling of whew, guilty. That's what Paul is describing here. He was once alive without the law, and yet, when the Lord was pleased to bring that commandment home to him, he said, sin revived and I died. I'll tell you, when we do come to see the law for what it is, and it shows us our guilt, and it excites in us actually rebellion, not willingness. That's what the law will do. That first, you know, wanting to wiggle out from under it, it brings forth sin unto death. So verses 10 through 12 underscores again what Paul is describing here, how sin corrupts the law and really challenges the purpose for which God give it. 
He never gave it as a means of salvation. The law was added, what? That sin might abound. We saw that already in Romans chapter 5. And uh, yet our sin would rather blame God than blame ourselves. The, the, this nature, the sin nature never takes the blame. If you don't believe it, next time somebody points out a fault of yours, what's your first reaction? Well, I dare you. It might be true, and it probably is true. Sometimes I think I'm glad you don't know the half. But nonetheless, our first reaction is one of rebellion. That's just what our nature is. But God has brought forth his law, his commandment, as a way, as I said, to point out our own sinfulness and our own rebellion and how we, we can see it when the Lord brings that commandment home to us. He says there in verse 10, the commandment, which was what? Ordained to life. The commandment, in other words, when God, by his commandment, reveals through his word our own sinfulness. He does that for those that he has ordained to life. But he said, I found it to be unto death. Now that's a good thing. Christ said that unless a man renounce himself and take up his cross, he cannot be my disciple. So when you look back and you think what the Lord used by his word, to bring you to bow as a guilty sinner before him. That's a good thing. Because that was ordained to life. The commandment, though, which was to bring life, he said, I found to bring death. And that's what sin does. It will cause us to look to ourselves rather than look to Christ. That's what sin does. You see, in verse 11... Sin taking occasion by the commandment, what deceived me, and by it, what slew me. That's all sin can do is deceive us. I'll tell you this, if I have one prayer to pray, Lord, don't leave me to myself. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to deceive others. And if this is what it takes, by your command and your law, that I should be killed then let me die. That I should never put any confidence in myself, but in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Do we really believe, here's the question, that nothing less than the death of the Son of God was required in order to justify a sinner such as I am? If you think so, then you've never known yourself. I've had people mockingly say, what kind of God would... Slay his son, a just God, a holy God, in order that he might be just to justify and save those that he's purposed to save. That we would be slain. And uh, see the deceitfulness of our sin. Verse 12, wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. We're not antinomian. We're just saying that that law can't help you. All it can do is show how holy God is and how sinful you are. And then lay you at Christ's feet that he alone be the one to be your savior. The law is holy. And so, verse 13, the law exposes, magnifies sin. He says there, but was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, for, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. That's what God does when he shows us who we are. Not just this sin or that, but the sinfulness of our sin. That's why I said when you can go back and read the law, if you come away feeling better about yourself, go back and read it again. You didn't do your homework. Because there's nothing in there that's going to give you any hope. That's why we don't look to it as any way of salvation or means of salvation. It's good in the hands of a holy God and by his spirit to show us the exceeding sinfulness of our sin. But it cannot, the law, that's why we don't come to it. 
We don't run to it for help because it can't restrain this flesh. That's how, how sinful our nature is. See that in verse 14? We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. That word carnal is the Greek word that means characterized by the flesh. Even if I think that somehow in the face of God's law, I can by my flesh somehow satisfy it, that in itself is sinful. Sinful thought. We're sold under sin. Such as the bondage of our sin. The law can't help you out. We've seen some cases like that. It doesn't matter if you know the judge. The law, the judge is bound by the law to give a sentence based on the, the crime you committed. And he can do no other. That's the way God is. He can't bend his law. Just because of our sinfulness or our inability to answer it. No, he's a just God. That's why it took nothing less than his son who did come and perfectly obeyed that law. Not only in word and deed, but the very spirit of the law. That when it was all said and done, God the Father was satisfied. Because his law was satisfied. But there's the struggle. Verse 15 to 19. Paul describes his sense of helplessness. And I understand. He said, what I'm doing, I don't understand. Things I would do, I don't do. <laughs> Things I would not do, those I do. What's all of that? Well, again, I believe it's the Lord using his word to keep us from putting any confidence in this flesh. This flesh isn't getting better. There's no more greater deceptive teaching, I believe, than those that teach that somehow, progressively, your flesh is getting better and better, and somehow you're sinning less and less. Those folk are deceived. I was deceived in thinking it for a while. But Paul says, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's not shoving off the responsibility but what he's saying is the real cause for who I am and what I do, in spite of what I know concerning the law and particularly concerning the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am what I am because of my sinfulness. But also I am what I am by the grace of God. So we're going to pick up with that again next time, the Lord willing, and uh, see the grand conclusion. Verses 24 and 25, old wretched man that I am, he doesn't say that I was, but that I am. Who, not what, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where it is. It's in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 226. 226. My Savior. I am not skilled to understand. What God hath willed, what God hath planned, I only know at His right hand is one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word indeed, Christ died for sinners, this I read, for in my heart I find a need of him to be my savior that he should leave his place on high and come for sinful man to die you count it strange so once did i before i knew my savior and oh, that he fulfilled may see the travail of his soul in me, and with his work contented be, as I with my dear Savior. Yea, living, dying, let me bring my strength, my solace from this spring, that he who lives to be my king once died to be my savior.
Amen. All right. We'll be dismissed. Look forward to next time. Lord willing.